morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this um, routing security webinar uh, hosted by Telia. Um, and this will also be an introduction to um, the Manners Initiative. This is something that's being um, uh, sponsored by the Internet Society. But just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Kevin Maynel, uh, and I'm the Senior Manager for Technical and Operational Engagement um, at the Internet Society. Uh, and one of the projects that I'm working on is the uh, Manners uh, Routing Security Initiative. So this morning I'm going to, this is a two-part uh, webinar. Um, and this morning I'm going to go run through the uh, introductory part. So this is going to cover uh, what is routing and why is it needed. Um, this won't be a really in-depth dive into how routing works, but sorry, brief introduction if you're not familiar with routing itself. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about the, what the routing problem is and why you should be aware of this and why you should be interested in uh, some of the issues. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what can be done to fix the routing problems. You know, why is routing security so hard? What routing security controls can be implemented? And you know, who should be doing this? Finally, I'm going to give an introduction to Manners itself, the Manners Initiative. Uh, and I will uh, give a demonstration of a tool that we have uh, called the Manners Observatory. Um, next week, uh, we have a second part. Uh, this will be on, well, will be next Tuesday, March the 9th. Uh, this will be covered by my colleague, Aftab Siddiqui. Uh, and this is much more of an in-depth dive, an in-depth technical dive. So this will cover routing in much, routing security in much more detail and how you can implement some of these um, routing security controls. So that's the very brief uh, overview of the agenda. So uh, quite a lot to get through, so I will dive straight in. Uh, straight, dive straight in into what, what is routing and you know, why is it needed. Um, I appreciate there's probably a number of network engineers on this call. I don't want to bore you too much uh, with, with the basic details, but in case your people aren't aware entirely of, of, of uh, how routing works, it's a very short introduction. But there are around um, 70, 71,000 um, networks connected to the internet. Um, so by this, I mean autonomous systems. So these uh, networks are identified by a unique autonomous system number. Um, these 71,000 networks, there are around 10,000 multi-home DSs. So in other words, networks that are connected to at least two and sometimes more other networks um, on the internet. So you can see the vast majority of networks, over 60,000 are actually you know, what you would say sort of end customer networks. Um, but that 10,000 is actually quite key because that's one of the sort of targets that we're, we're, we're um, interested in. So all of these networks, they use um, something called border gateway protocol to exchange the reachability information. Uh, in other words, the networks that they know how to reach. And from these, the routers build um, a routing table um, in, in order to pick the best route to send packets across the internet. So pretty much all of these, well, all of these networks will have a router. Um, all of these routers, um, they, they use those routers to connect to the internet and those routers exchange um, the reachability information. So um, BGP uses 32-bit AS numbers um, to identify themselves. Um, and in case you're wondering where these AS numbers come from, um, these are issued by regional internet registries um, to what's called a local internet registry. Um, now, a local internet registry will normally be an internet service provider. Sometimes it can be a very large enterprise, sometimes a government department. Um, but it will be unique on the internet. Um, in the case of Europe, in the case of Sweden, um, it will be uh, you'll go to the RIPE NCC uh, for that for that uh, that uh, number resource. Then you also have um, IP prefixes, which are blocks of um, IP addresses, which I guess most people would be familiar with, um, and these are linked with uh, AS uh, numbers which are used to decide routing policies, or in other words, where traffic can be sent. So the more observant of you may recognize that this particular IP prefix belongs to Telia, um, and also the AS number 1299 is a, a, 
uh, is a Telia AS. Uh, Telia actually has a number of ASs as a large network, um, but for the purposes of this example, I just used uh, the, some of their main the main AS and uh, one of their prefixes. Um, so the ASNs and the IP blocks are collectively known as number resources. Um, and uh, I already mentioned there were 71,000 AS numbers, um, but there are around um, 866,000 um, IP prefixes being routed on the internet. Um, and um, yeah, they, um, those, 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 uh, those were the sort of effectively the number of destinations possible on the internet. So what's the problem with routing? Um, well, one of the main reasons is that um, BGP is inherently based on um, unverified trust. Um, it was devised back in the late 80s and was pretty much um, uh, in it reached its current state of sort of early 90s, uh, mid, early, to late, uh, early to mid 90s. Um, and it's actually been a pretty reliable protocol. It works really well. Um, it's, it's generally pretty reliable. But um, it was divided in an era when there was more trust between networks. There were less networks. Generally, network operators knew each other a lot better. Um, there was no need to have um, verified trust. So as an upshot, there's no built-in validation that uh, routing updates are legitimate. Um, and essentially anybody can announce anything on the internet. If you've got a router and you've got a connection to the internet, there's really nothing to stop you um, um, announcing any, any number resource, whether you actually have the right to do that or not. And as a result, um, for various reasons, malicious reasons, but also accidental configuration uh, reasons, um, the routing system has it's confined itself under attack. So this is an attempt by um, CADA. So this is a, a, a project based at the University of San Diego. It attempts to do a lot of tra traffic measurements of the internet and do a lot of mapping of the internet. Um, and they have um, attempted to draw a map of the internet. Um, this is, to some extent, trying to be geographically correct insofar as you can do this with the internet. Um, but it really tries to show all of the different relationships between all of the different networks that constitute the internet. Um, in the middle there, you, you can see uh, where the sort of denser area, that's pretty much the tier one networks that have connections to many of the other, most of the other networks on the internet. As you go out towards the edge, they would be the customer edge networks. Um, now, you can pretty much see that this is a complete mess, like a big spider's web, a very dense, complex spider's web. And I use this, this diagram just to illustrate the complexity of all the sort of different relationships that would need to be maintained on the internet and, and the issue of trying to verify, you know, who is on the other end of the connection, other end of the connection. Um, and that's really what we're trying to uh, address here. So there are three uh, main routing types of routing incident that, that cause problems. Um, I'm going to delve a little bit more into these in the next slides. Um, but there's something called uh, route hijacking. You have route leaks um, and IP address spoofing, which is probably more familiar to, to, to the average person, um, yeah, the, the, the lay person on the internet. Um, all of these uh, incidents, you can find real examples of significant problems. Um, but there are also problems. We see these problems every single day, uh, every single day of the week. Um, I'm particularly looking at this every week, um, and you know, certainly I can see. I could pick a random network, and I could see a route hijack. I could see a route leak somewhere. Um, address spoofing is I have less visibility into, but that's certainly also happening um, on a regular basis. Um, so what is a route hijack or a leak? Well, this is the illegitimate advertisement of prefixes. So in other words, blocks of IP addresses um, that basically direct internet traffic from its intended path to somewhere else. Um, the difference between the two is that a route leak is usually accidental, um, whereas a route hijack is uh, 
usually intentional, it's done for deliberate purpose. Um, so just a sort of quick run through, um, if you're a end customer or a customer network, um, you know, your upstream provider may well be saying, okay, I can take your traffic to Google, which is where a lot of people will be wanted to get to. Um, but let's say that you had a multi-homed connection. Um, another, connect, another provider could also make that same claim as well. Um, now, the traffic may well still reach the end destination, uh, but you may not want your traffic traversing that particular path, or you're not sure where that traffic may end up. Um, and that sort of is the, the, the fundamental issue here with um, routing security. So we have this um, sort of overview here of, of, of a route leak. Um, so we have this customer down in the bottom, which is AS64502. Um, it's trying to get to Google, uh, which is 8.8.8.8. Um, and normally this would traverse up to its upstream provider, which is 64500. Um, that would head across the internet over to Google. Now, down in the left-hand corner, you have um, another AS, another network. So that's 64501. Um, that normally, you, the other AS doesn't want to send its traffic through that particular uh, network. But because of a lack of controls, this has misadvertised the fact that it can reach uh, Google. Now, uh, there is a connection there. And because it's a net made this announcement, um, under certain circumstances, the traffic can traverse through that network um, up, back up through the internet towards Google. Now, in some cases, uh, this this will reach the end destination, but in some cases, the the uh, resources, the routing resources, or the end systems at that particular network may be inadequate. They may the, the the connection may be inadequate for the amount of bandwidth traversing it, and that can cause problems. Um, now classic example was back in June 2019, where uh, a network provider in uh, Pennsylvania um, accidentally leaked a route to Verizon, uh, which is a very big service provider, as I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, and that ended up uh, directing a lot of traffic to a power utility company in Pennsylvania, um, which essentially acted as a denial of service attack. Um, not intentional, but the effect was a denial of service attack and traffic would black hole into that uh, into that particular destination. So then you have route hijacking. So again, as I mentioned, this is more intentional. Um, so this is where a network operator or attacker is impersonating another network operator uh, or pretending that uh, the network is their client. Um, so this is routing traffic to the attacker and the victim gets uh, an outage. So again, um, down in the left-hand corner, AS64501 wants to send its traffic to Google or send the received traffic to Google. But this other attacking uh, network up in the top left-hand corner um, is announcing the same route as the, the network in the bottom left-hand corner. So the, again, the effect is that, that traffic is being sent to the attacker. Um, and that can be done for black holing reasons. It can be done for reconnaissance reasons. It can be done for man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, what you'll often find is that um, route hijacking is sometimes done for censorship reasons that um, you know, in particular countries, um, the telecom company or the ISP, the large ISP um, is asked to, um, uh, to redirect traffic to a particular destination to a, to a, to a black hole. Um, there was a very famous attack, well, attack, accidental misconfiguration with respect to YouTube back in 20, uh, 2008. Uh, and that actually caused a lot of YouTube traffic to, to, um, to be dropped from around the world because of this uh, attempt to, to, to sense the traffic to and from uh, YouTube. So they, this is, these are real issues that you see. Sometimes you'll see a big incident once or twice a year, but this is happening um, every, day of the, um, every day of the week. And then you have IP spoofing. Um, so there's sort of two main issues here. So this is where a sender of a packet sends a forged source IP address. So in other words, it sends to a particular destination, but 
in order to route packets back to its uh, own source of origin, it will put in a source IP address. Now, normally that will be legitimate, you know, because obviously you want your packets to come back to your network. Uh, but in some cases, you can put in a forged source IP address. Um, and if there's no source controls, uh, controls of this, um, this, this cause issues um, uh, with respect to, you know, you can use it for um, application level attacks, you can use this for denial of service attacks. Uh, this is often used to mark the origin of, um, you know, for example, uh, botnet attacks. So there's a number of reasons why attackers would want to do this. Um, and it marks the, the, the origin of the, the, the attack as well. Um, so we also have um, reflection um, reflection attacks. So this is typically di distributed denial of service. So this is where you send um, a packet or an attacker sends a packet to a, to a, a, a convenient uh, re reflector source. So again, typically this would be a DNS server. It can also be an NTP server. There's other um, other sources of reflection that could be used. Uh, but the, uh, DNS is a typical one. So a packet gets sent, say, with a DNS query with a, with a, a spoofed source IP address. Um, the, the, the spoofed source IP address is of a victim computer. So the, say, for example, the DNS server will receive all of these um, requests and send them back to, the, to a completely different machine, which is the intended victim. Um, and that's the, the, you know, the origin of a lot of um, well, most distributed denial of service attacks. Um, so again, not a good thing to um, be allowing um, emanating from a network. So again, this is just an example uh, from I think a seven month period in uh, last year. We pulled this from BGP stream. Um, so this is not even leaked. This is BGP, BGP hijacks or suspected BGP hijacks. Um, and as you can see, um, yeah, there's something happening every day uh, over that, that period. Um, and you can sort of see the scale of this as well. Okay, so that's uh, the, the, the basic explanation of um, uh, you know, what, what the problems are. But what can, we, what can we do to actually fix these problems? Well, maybe we need to sort of give a, uh, an explanation of, you know, okay, these problems are well known. They've been well recognized for many years. But, you know, why, why is it still happening? Why is router security so hard? Well, part of the problem is that every operator needs to contribute to router security. Um, but in fact, there's actually very little incentive to do this by yourself because implementing routing security measures doesn't actually bring immediate benefits for an individual operator. Um, really that everybody, or at least a majority of networks need to be doing this for this to be effective. So you know, it's very easy to say, well, okay, if I do this, it doesn't bring me any, any particular advantage. Um, it's just extra work. Um, the other problem is that routing incidents can be really hard to identify and debug. Um, it's, I mean, I was a little bit surprised by this myself, but it's really quite surprising, but even very large networks just simply are not aware of that they have routing incidents and they're not, they're not, they're, they're not aware of where they're occurring. Um, and once we started to put together this manners observatory tool, um, it, it actually became a lot clearer for a lot of operators where these issues were and what they needed to fix. Um, so that that's also been sort of part of the problem, having really good tools to identify this stuff. Um, it comes back to you know it, it needs collective action, um, and 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 that's what we're trying to achieve um, with with uh, with manners. Now the internet operates very significantly um, on the basis of norms. Um, there's certain things that you do on the internet. To, that everyone recognizes that need to be done to make it work effectively, um, whether that's email, whether that's web, web browsing, websites, you know, web security, DNS security. Um, there are some things that are widely accepted as good practice. Um, and now we've, we've, the, the, the issues with the DNS, for example, have been well known for a long time. The issues of uh, security with websites have been well known for a long time. And you know, in the last few years, there's been a huge push on, on implementing 
things like DNSSEC and things like TLS, and these have become much more norm, much more of a norm than you know, perhaps they were 10 years ago. But we haven't really got there yet with routing security, um, and we need to. That's what the, the sort of thing that we need to shift the paradigm. We need to shift the paradigm here. So we need to accept that there are some things, there are certain practices that should be done and should be become the norm uh, on the internet. Basically, what this comes down to, it's very simple. It's, you know, do not accept and propagate the mistakes of others. So in other words, validate what you accept from um, other networks. So in other words, you know, protect your neighbors from your own mistakes. Um, um, for example, so, so not through allowing hijacking and not through allowing leaks uh, on your network. The other important thing is to make sure that your uh, number resources, so that's your AS numbers and your IP prefixes, um, those can be, those are up to date and those can be validated by others. Um, and there's actually two main ways of doing this. Uh, one is through internet routing registries and the other is uh, using RPKI, which is, I would say, slightly newer, although it's still been around, still been possible for about 10 years at least. Um, so, Routing security controls. Um, going back to our diagram of you know one network masquerading as another network, um, but there are things that you can do. So, for example, if the network that you wish to reach uh, actually has its number of resources uh, registered, either in an IRR or through RPKI through the RPKI system, um, yeah, that that customer network or the originating network can actually validate that the announcements are correct. They are coming from uh, where they should be coming from. Um, so it's really important to, um, to look at the IRR and the RPKI side of things, because that is what's allowing other networks to validate your number resources and that you're authorized to originate them. Um, so again, they both sort of effectively do the same thing. Um, IRR is, IRRs have been around for quite a long time. So there are a number of these, um, no pun intended. Um, so you have, for example, all of the regional internet registries operate in internet routing registry. Um, and they put in the, the IP prefixes and the AS numbers into that. Um, this is sort of meta aggregated by uh, one of the original IRRs, RAD, RADB. Um, so these are all uh, effectively synchronized. Um, the problem with the internet routing registry is that basically you have the similar problem that pretty much anyone can put anything in there. And perhaps the bigger problem is that uh, it, 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 you have to, you know, a network actually has to take, have to actively um, update that information. So let's say they acquire another IP prefix or they change a prefix or uh, they acquire another network um, with those number of resources, that all needs to be updated uh, in the Internet Routing Registry. And it's very easy for that to get out of sync or for things not to get registered. Um, and, and typically what you find is that IPv6 resources are not registered. Um, that's a very common uh, thing that we see. RPKI, this is where you could, this is maybe a more effective system. Um, so this is where you uh, make a cryptographic attestation, attestation that um, um, you know, you're, you're allowed to uh, originate a particular prefix or a particular AS number, uh, and that can be cryptographically verified through a, a PKI system that are ultimately operated by the regional internet registries. Um, so for example, you know, uh, Telia AS2199, um, they're allowed to originate, you know, 103.47.204 slash 22. Um, this is basically but either system can um, uh, can validate. So who who can make the impact here? Well, certainly the uh, anybody that's operating a, a network connected to the internet that has an AS number for sure. Um, but we're also looking at uh, you know, in particular transit providers such as Telia. Um, they will have a, they can have a really big impact on this because they're carrying a lot of traffic from a lot of networks. Um, but also IXPs, so um, IXPs are obviously interconnecting multiple networks. 
so they can have a really strong role in encouraging their members to uh, undertake uh, implement and undertake uh, you know strong routing security measures um, and then last but very much not least uh, we have content uh, distribution networks of cloud providers so um, yes, most of those actions they can take are very similar to the uh, network operator actions um, but there's a couple of very specific actions that, that they can take as well which I'll touch upon in a moment so this brings us to uh, to manners um, mutually um, assured non routing security so what we're trying to do here is really uh, bring together all of the best practices that have been around for quite a long time on the internet and bring these together into some well-defined actions which can help you know well hopefully eliminate all of the most common threats to the routing system um, so this is nothing new under the sun uh, all of these things are well known uh practices um but one thing that we're trying to do is bring this together in a in a sort of common package and say right if, if you perform three of these four actions um this will may have a real impact on improving routing security um on the internet and it's really about participants so network operators ixps cloud providers um you know, collaborating together and taking some shared responsibility for the security of the internet infrastructure um, and you know, certainly in the past past few years, you know, there's been active active measures to improve, as I say, DNS and web security and mail security and various other aspects. But this is something that you know, really hasn't been hugely addressed um, up until quite recently. So what we have is three programs for uh, three separate programs of network operators, ISPs, and cloud providers. Um, and what we're trying to achieve is, is everyone benefiting from improved routing security. So uh, encouraging networks to implement these routing security practices, but more specifically also raise customer awareness so that they actually will demand this from their, their providers, you know, maybe even distinguish, uh, you know, who they're getting their internet service from on the basis of well are these guys performing good routing security practices but this isn't about you know stick as well it's also carrot so we're also there to help networks to help networks you know easily identify and address a lot of the problems that we see um so that's where the manners observatory comes in um, which i'm going to do a short demo on um and the aim is that the more operators that apply these actions, the fewer incidents that they will do, uh, they, that will occur. Uh, and actually, there is some evidence that as uh, operators have applied these actions, that we have seen a drop in routing incidents. And then we also want to develop a sort of historical database of incidents to sort of demonstrate where there are, where there are, you know, we can identify where there are particular problems but also whether we can see things improving over time um, or not. So are these measures actually um, being effective? But ultimately, really, to build this self-regulating community of you know, security-minded operators um, who, who are really committed to making the routing infrastructure more secure. So um, I'm not going to go through the actions for every program, but I'm just going to touch upon the, the actions for the network operators program, which is by far the largest. Um, so here there are four actions. Um, uh, so action one is uh, filtering. So this is really about preventing propagation of internet routing information. So this is ensuring that you're only announcing um, um, the announcements from your network and also those of your customers that those are correct um, so you're not announcing things that you're not authorized to announce um, i'm going to skip two for a moment uh, i go on to action three which is coordination so this is very simple making sure that you maintain um, contact information uh, in a in a usually an rir database uh, to make sure that people can contact you and that co contact is responsive and that you undertake if you do have a routing incident that you will respond to that within well, at least 72 hours and hopefully much faster than that 
And then uh, the fourth action is global validation. So this is making sure that you publish your number of resources um, in, um, uh, in either an IRR or using RPKI. Coming back to action two, so that's anti-spoofing. So at the moment, this is a, an optional action. So this is a uh, network should prevent uh, traffic to spoof source IP addresses from emanating from the networks. Um, so whether that's from your own network or from a customer network, you're making sure that they're not uh, forged uh, IP addresses on the packets. Um, there's various reasons why that's optional at the moment, but ultimately we would like to move towards that, making that, strengthening that as well. Um, in terms of time, I'm not going to go into this, the other actions for the other programs too much. Um, the DIXP program, uh, there are some of the similar actions there. Uh, there's other ones that are very distinct to IXPs, but just to be aware that those uh, exist. And then similarly for CDN and cloud program, um, most of those actions are very similar to the network operators, but there's a couple of extra actions there as well. Um, and just to mention here that uh, if you haven't implemented browser security measures yet, if you haven't implemented manners, uh, we do have some technical guidance here. We have the implementation guide for network operators. Um, and uh, there's a, for each of these actions, there's configuration examples, there's uh, explanations of how you can implement these, uh, all of these things. Um, this is based on best operational practices developed from network operators around the world, um, and it actually has recognition from the right community uh, as RIPE 706. Uh, so again, it's a good source of information. Uh, just in the process of updating that at the moment, um, and process to make sure it's all up to date, uh, one thing we needed to add was the LACNIC um, IRR configuration examples, um, and there's a few other things, but yeah, it's still a quite a good source of information there. Uh, and briefly mentioning, um, we have some training modules on this as well, which goes into a bit more depth uh, of how to um, uh, uh, implement some of the manners actions, well, all of the manners actions. Okay, so I'm going to just give a brief demo uh, on the manners observatory here, um, but a quick explanation of what this is. So this is a tool that we developed to impartially benchmarks, impartially benchmark um, ASs, um, really to improve the transparency of this process. Um, in the early days, we were having to sort of rely on people's, well, networks you know, saying that they'd implemented what they said they had, uh, but this tool actually allows us to check that. Well, it also allows others to check that, which is the perhaps more important thing. Um, so really to give this sort of factual state of security of the internet routing system, but the most useful function is at the moment is to allow managed participants to actually check for their own conformity with these routing security actions. Um, this is not data that we're effectively generating ourselves. Um, this is coming from a number of publicly available data sources, so particular BGP stream, the CIDR report, um, the CADA spoofer database, which uh, that's the only Anti-spoofing is the only thing that we can't measure passively um, from, from the outside of a network. Uh, it does require a network to actively run a, uh, the CADA spoofer software so that, that, that CADA can look for spoof packets. Uh, that gets recorded into their database and we pull that, that information from them. And then we look at other sources of data like the right database, this peering DB is also a really important source of information. Um, the various IRRs and of course yeah for the moment RPK validator but that will change uh, that that's going away in the future but we'll we'll find some alternative for that right so I'm now going to just switch to give us sort of hopefully a live demo um, if I can um, of the managed observatory and hopefully everybody can see this um, so when you go to, so this is a, at observatory.manners.org, um, anybody can go to this URL uh, and look at this information um, and you'll come initially to a dashboard that will show each of the four manners actions um, as, as these sort of blue circles here and that really sort of indicates the conformancy with each of the, the four 
network operator manners actions. Uh, action four is split into uh, two components, so IRR and RPKI. So that's action four is actually these last two. Um, now this is looking at the global view here, and this is the global view for for March. Um, we can actually go back and look at other months as well. Uh, we can go back. Well, I think we've got nearly two years worth of data here, um, and you can sort of look at the the, the sort of conformity scores. Um, so we we actually collect much more information than this, and I will go into that detail in a moment. Uh, but the idea is to kind of go give a very sort of simple conformity check. Uh, for, for either one network or groups of networks. So here we're looking at the whole world. Um, you know, we can sort of see that, that yeah, in terms of routing incidents, um, you know, actually there's a relatively small number of problems that affect a relatively small number of networks. But of course, with 71,000 AS is even, you know, 1% is, is still quite significant. Um, you know, you're sort of looking at most networks in the world have register some sort of contact information. Again, similarly with their their uh, IP prefixes and routes, um, you know, vast majority of networks have registered those in a uh, in an IRR. But then, of course, we look at RPKA, and that's maybe less less good. Um, uptake of that has been quite slow. Um, it's increasing, but still quite slow. Um, but we can do this by country as well. So I can look at Sweden and Telia being Swedish uh, uh, network. Um, so again, these are the sort of figures for Sweden. You can also click on this by click on the country as well. It's okay for Sweden, that's big enough. If you're looking at Monaco, that's a little bit more tricky. I'm trying to hit it so you can just type that in at the top, the, the name. Um, so Sweden's doing a bit better. Um, you know, it seems to be 100% for contact information. Um, IRR, it's sort of around the global average um, and actually better for RPKI as well. Um, again, 30% is not fantastic, but it's definitely better than the global average. Um, we can actually do this by uh, different regions as well. If you're interested in how Europe is doing or the right region, um, so this is this is these are the same the same information for the right region. Uh, it doesn't change hugely uh, region by region. Um, you can do it by UN region as well. So you could look at Europe, all of Europe, depending on how you define Europe. Um, but okay, that that's all very nice. But um, you know, and, and it, instead you can aggregate data from a custom set of uh, ASs as well. But really, we want to know you want to know about your own network. So I'm going to go to Telia here, um, uh, and I say Telia has a number of ASs, but I think this is probably the main one. Um, and this gives you a score for Telia, uh, and this is perhaps much more interesting. Now, I'm going to prefix this with a caveat that Telia is a tier one provider. They take traffic from a lot of places around the world. Um, they uh, they also joined Manners when the requirements were slightly different than they are now. Um, and I will go through explain why their score is only 49 percent. Uh, for filtering, uh, there are reasons for that, and it's not necessarily bad reasons. Um, so I don't have uh, we we don't have the spoofing data for this particular month. I, I, we do have it for previous months. Um, you can actually go back and look at the history of Telia's sort of conformance scores. Uh, so they obviously ran an anti-spoofing uh, check back in May, June, July, August last year, and also in October. Uh, and that they scored 100 percent. So they're doing it looks like they're doing anti spoofing measures uh, based on that from what we can see. Um, but yeah, just coming back to here. So again, uh, they put their contact information in uh, pretty much. Uh, they've registered all the routes, uh, which is good. And actually, they're doing pretty well for RPK as well. Um, there, there are good reasons why that may not be 100 percent, for example, with legacy prefixes, um, there may be customer prefixes uh, that can't be registered. So th th there are probably reasons why that isn't 100%. Um, but I can actually look at the details for this, for Telia, um, and, and go through. And I can find out, you know, have they had route leaks? Have they had route hijacks? Uh, and you know, sure enough, we, we can see it's possible, and I would use the word possible here, 
there have been possibly a number of rat, uh, route leaks from Telia and possibly a number of route hijacks. Um, I will point out that BGP stream throws up false positives. Um, some of these could well be and possibly are, probably are false positives, but it does give you sort of a, an idea to where to start looking. You can look at, okay, why is that prefix? Why is that being flagged as a route leak? Um, the same with the route hijacked as well. Um, they, they look like they've been uh, a few route hijacks look from a similar group of addresses, um, but you can actually look where the path through the internet here. Uh, and, and if you need more information, you can go to the BGP stream ID and, and check at that uh, the, the original source of data. Um, Bogons, okay, we're less concerned about Bogons because um, uh, there's, there's reasons for Bogons uh, sometimes. So these are, these are resources that should never be uh, routed on the internet. Um, but what we find is that a number of the regional internet registries will actually uh, mark um, some legitimate number of resources as Bogon, perhaps if the bill hasn't been paid or if um, they've lost contact with the um, holder of those resources. So they're not kind of real Bogons, they're just administrative Bogons. Um, this looks like somehow there's a default IPv6 route has been um, advertised on the internet. I'm not sure why that's there, but that's pretty clear, that one. Um, and then there's a number of other prefixes here. Um, yeah, some of these, um, they, they I, I did check some of these, and these are North American prefixes, or they're from registered with Aaron, and I suspect they're administrative bogons there. Uh, but we can do this for every action, so we could look for um, uh, anti-spoofing, if there were uh, spoof packets coming coming from, from Telia, uh, we could check where they were coming from, but they haven't had any, or we haven't got any information for this month. And then unregistered prefixes here as well. Uh, these are the list of prefixes that are apparently unregistered by Telia uh, in an IRR. Um, often you'll see IPv6 prefixes here, but yeah, these are all IPv4. And um, you can also look at Okay, what prefixes do you not have uh, rowers created for? And, and if there are invalid ones, which you sometimes see, uh, they will show up and you'll get a list of those um, as well. So that's, you know, it's a pretty powerful tool, this, um, and, um, you know, it does help identify where there might be some, some problems. And I'd like to thank Tilia for allowing me to use this information. <laughs> um, uh, and I hope I've explained, you know, why they might not be 100% for everything um, um, uh, uh, in the observatory here. Okay, I'm going to just quickly switch back and hopefully uh, we can, you can see these slides. Um, so, um, yeah, so just to say that at the moment, the, the, the public can view all of the aggregated data that's publicly available. Um, at the moment, Manus, only the Manus participants can see the detailed data about their own networks. Um, but if you're interested in joining Manus and you have some potentially some things you want to work through, uh, we can also create an account which will give you access to your own details as well. So that will help you work through those uh, particular issues. Um, we can give this to CSERTs as well uh, for any networks in their constituency, uh, also for you know, critical infrastructure sort of uh, agencies. Uh, we have done that as well, uh, and also you know, legitimate researchers. We 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 can give uh, full detailed access to um, in the observatory. Um, and I already sort of discussed these caveats. You know, there are still some false positives, particularly with BGP Stream. Uh, we're working to fix some of those things, um, and there, sometimes there's good reasons for non-100% performance. But at the end of the day, that this is all um, public, public, uh, publicly available data anyway. Okay, so now uh, just to see, okay, you know, so so that's you know the overview of the the Manners um, um, program and Binance Initiative. Uh, that's an overview of the, the, some of the things we've been doing. Um, the tools that the observatory tool that you can use to, to sort of identify where these problems are. But it's maybe just sort of you know, useful to say, you know, how's it, is this actually having an impact? Um, and I think it is. Um, so at the moment, we have um, 
last year we saw a huge growth in manus participation um despite all of the covid issues uh, it seemed to be a good opportunity for, for for networks to really get their routing security in order and we saw a sort of huge spike in in participation which is a really positive thing and, and actually some from, from some really large uh isps as well so that's really really good um i would point out that telia was really one of our founder uh, our founder um, uh, participants so they've been a member for quite some time um but yeah certainly we you know so 530 isps and that's about 600 constituting about 650 asns um 63 isps and then the cloud program uh that's only started um sort of middle of last year uh that's really uh, that's actually now up to 20 participants there um so certainly in terms of participation rates we're, we're doing quite well but the important thing is, you know, is this actually having an impact on on uh, instance? Um, and you know, the evidence suggests that it probably is. Um, as the the, the number of uh, networks participating and actually applying the routing security measures have have uh, have, have uh, increased, we've actually seen a marked decrease in incidents. Uh, and I think that probably is a positive thing. Um, and of course, a lot of networks, even if they're not actually managed participants, they have started to sort of take routing security seriously and are implementing these practices. So that's also having an impact as well. So, um, yeah, so the evidence suggests, you know, this is still early days and you, know, you can draw certain conclusions from this. But yeah, I, it does seem to suggest that there is some 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 positive impact here. Um, right. In the interest of time, um, I'm going to stop here um need to except to say that that you know manners is actually even beyond the network operator community is really starting to gain some visibility and credibility we're getting mentioned in the media and actually even in 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 government circles which are maybe a good or bad thing i don't know but uh, at least people are aware that this is something that's important um you know and certainly you know net, the really important thing is networks are saying you know we really should Join manners, and we really should implement these these, these practices, uh, and that's really good to see. But if you're interested in uh, joining or participating, um, please go to the manners website. Uh, if you're ready to join, um, even if you're not ready to join, you can still make an application, and we can sort of give you access to the observatory. We can work through any issues you may have, um, and and uh, we you know, we can take that from there. So. Um, yeah, please, please consider joining the community. So with that, I will pass back to the moderator. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kevin. And so we have gotten in a couple of questions uh, during your presentation, and I was thinking that we could uh, walk through a couple of them uh, right now. So uh first a practical question whether the presentation and the slides that you've shown will be available for download and i think that yes a version of these slides can be available afterwards yes uh, that's no problem perfect and i think also you just covered we we received a question here how how you request access to the observatory and how you do that but i think that the slide that we're currently seeing is is answering that question as well yeah if you just send uh i i think it's uh I, I i i think it's on the website i hope it's on the website uh but if not uh if you send to manners at isop.org uh I, we'll pick it up uh if you send an email to me i'll pick it up and we can arrange access perfect um and then we received a question whether so it's about the the impact that COVID-19 may have had on the internet in general in terms of changing uh, usage patterns and people people working from home and traveling less and so on and so forth and um, whether you have you know any thoughts or or um, comments on that from from your perspective whether how that relates to routing security yeah so uh I don't have completely empirical data for this to sort of definitively say that um, incidents have gone up or down um, because of COVID-19. Um, one thing is definitely for certain 
is that traffic has increased a lot uh, because of COVID-19. And you've certainly seen that in particular countries as well. Um, we've seen that from sort of different data uh, from IXPs and from, from, from operators that there's been a huge increase in traffic. So you might sort of think that that would cause a you know, proportional, uh, proportional increase in the number of incidents as well. Um, but actually the data that we've seen show a decrease in incidents. So, you know, is that because people are being more responsible? Uh, is that because network operators are actually taking, are actively taking round of security measures? Um, very difficult to say, but certainly, we certainly know that operators are really taking round of security. Some of the large operators are taking round of security much more seriously and actually actively implementing. So we've seen this because we've been working with them. Some of the largest ISPs have come to us and we've been working with them to, to, to improve their router security. So I think that, has really had an impact uh, just anecdotally ju just from what my discussions and what from what we've been observing thank you for that and then a final question here is how often one needs to check if you know a network is hijacked or leaked if there's any frequency there or if you can provide some some comments on that um uh, well, <laughs> how long is a piece of string? Um, I, I, I think, you know, for a large network, probably every day, perhaps. Um, and certainly the observatory, it rolls over every day. So, the, you know, it's not real time, but it's usually within 24 hours, you'll see something. Um, I would say if it's a major leak, um, you'll know about that pretty quick as an operator, because everyone will tell you. Um, you know, we had last year where there was a, it, it was a, it was a misconfiguration from a very large um, provider, um, which I, I'm sure people in the business would know what it was. Um, and they were, they pretty much, yeah, uh, it was pretty obvious to the rest of the internet very quickly, uh, because of course traffic got dropped from a number of uh, uh, content providers as well. So they were up in arms um, saying, oh, you know, tra traffic's not reaching us. Um, so, mm -hmm. you, you know, you'll be certainly told, but what perhaps is, you know, there's, it's the stuff that that maybe the route leak stuff that may not be necessarily be noticeable, and traffic's not taking an optimal path that might not be so noticeable if you're not doing actively and not actively monitoring. So, you know, I, I, I mean, certainly for a network of any significant size, I think probably this should be looked at every day. Um, but you know, it just sort of depends on what the impact is um, as, as to you know, how noticeable this would be. Okay. Thank you so much, Kevin. And those were all the questions that we've received. If anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out to either Kevin or um, email through the follow-up email that will come from, from the, uh, the webinar platform shortly. Um, and I also want to extend a big thank you to, to you, Kevin, from, from Telecarrier's side for providing this uh, really interesting presentation for us today. So thank you so much. Yeah, just to mention that the second part, um, the more depth technical configuration guide uh, will be uh, on the 9th next week. So yeah, please exactly. join us for that. Yes, for anyone who hasn't registered, it is available through uh, both Telecarrier's website and on Telecarrier's social channels and as well for the Internet Society and Manners. Um, both social channels and the website. So feel free to go to whichever of those you prefer. And thank you so much, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your day.